talk to us ab about this FDA approval, about this drug, what it could mean for the six million Americans who are living with Alzheimer's? Yeah, Alicia, I think the first thing to point out about the drug, as you heard from Kate's piece, is that there was really nothing else for Alzheimer's Correct. patients. Yeah. And so I think that that's the first thing. However, it comes with caveats, not just the side effects potentially that you mentioned, brain bleeds, brain swelling, those are not trivial, but we really also find that this drug works the best in people who are kind of earlier in their disease. Mild cognitive impairment are words that you're gonna hear a lot about this drug because that's exactly who was in the trial people who are not late stage in Alzheimer's, but earlier. What we know though, is that we can pick up mild cognitive decline in people by checking them in their primary care offices. We can also do brain scans and look for those amyloid plaques and proteins that you can see on MRI or on PET scans and see if someone is in that phase that would fit this trial. It's 18 months of, of uh, IV therapy every two weeks, Alicia. So this is not, you know, an easy pill or an easy injection that you can do at home. And many doctors will have to do monitoring brain exams and tests and some detailed exams of the brain that you heard about to prevent or at least watch for that brain swelling. So this isn't something to do without having a very informed conversation between your doctor and your family. I want to pick up on something that you said, Dr. Patel, which is the idea that th this is the only thing that is available, right? That there that there has been sort of a dearth of availabilities, and you'll tell me where I'm wrong there. Because you deal in public health, to me this just seems like it opens the possibility of having conversation about the moment we find ourselves in, where you have one of America's largest generations becoming older and older. You have a a disease that there is still no cure for, but also very few right. tools available to. And that is that is both relevant to, to people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment. It's also really important to all of the caretakers, to the families, yeah. to an American system that is not built for the possibility of long-term care for that many Americans. And through that lens, the emergence of this drug seems particularly critical and timely. It does, and I hope that what this does is force our healthcare system and our system of access in general, to your point, to really acknowledge caregivers, to acknowledge that we do not prepare, not even just for aging, at least we don't prepare for anything related to long-term care, to your point. We even took away the possibility that we had of having some sort of long-term care insurance as a mandatory or guaranteed benefit for Americans. We took that possibility away because of the budget. And so this was over a decade ago when I worked in policy. So I think that we, all of this is, is why I think this is, you hear those voices crying for something because what I hope this does, it reminds me of the 90s when I was in medical school and we had our first monoclonal antibody cancer treatment that had come out. They were new drugs at the time. They were breakthrough drugs, but they were the first of decades of what would be advancement and also learning how to better give care for cancer patients. I hope we can do this not just for Alzheimer's, but for any aging related illnesses. And, and I, I can't stress enough that we still in this country don't acknowledge the role of the caregiver I think that that's just as important as someone to think about in front of you as I do the patient in front of me. And so that's all of those factors need to be considered. The Alzheimer's Association and others are really trying to do everything to educate the public about resources available. So I encourage people, have these conversations with your doctors, but also ask about financial resources because going to and from these infusion centers, if you're, especially if you're in rural America, if you're not close to one of these hospitals, Alicia, that's gonna be its own access crisis of its own on top well, I, of what we already have. I've got less than a minute left, Dr. Patel, but to that point, I wanna ask you about the Medicare providing coverage and, and that caveat right. to Medicare coverage. Yeah, it, this caveat we've seen before, we've seen it with a cardiac device. I actually don't think it will be as much of a barrier as the frank access barriers, getting infusion shares for people every two weeks, having two to three hours of monitoring and doing that for 18 months for a population that has had no options, for six million and counting, even more in the next decade, that's a lot that our system has not been able to bear. And many of those Medicare costs still have a copay, so don't forget that, it's not all in. People will have out-of-pocket costs. 